thank you for joining us. Again, this is the life and legacy of William S. Yellowrobe Jr. I am Deborah Murad. I'm the executive director here at Cop DG Copyright Management. We are an estate planning consultancy and a copyright management organization uh, formed by the Dramatist Guild of America. Uh, we're particularly concerned with the legacy of the authors that are enrolled with us. And we want to make sure that they're constantly in the conversation. And that is really what's led us to this evening's presentation, honoring the life and the work of the great native and more accurately, great American playwright, William S. Yellowrobe Jr. This was a rather easy panel to assemble because not one person that we asked didn't want to participate or didn't want to share um, how Bill impacted their lives. Uh, and I can just tell from that that he's a very special man and I really, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing more about him uh, myself tonight. Um, to that end, I'm going to soon pass the mic to Margot Lukens, but let me tell you who she is. First of all, she's a professor of English at the University of Maine, where Bill was a colleague. Her interests include um, Wabanaki literary and storytelling history, indigenous plays and playwrights, and the literature of American colonization. She has produced and directed plays by indigenous playwrights on campus and in the region. She actually began collaborating with Bill um, in 2003, and they created an intertribal, uh, they did some intertribal theater performances, including a reader's theater, radio productions, and full productions. She was actually the editor of one of his wonderful volumes, Grandchildren of the Buffalo Soldiers, which is available through UCLA Press. If you're interested, um, you can check our website to find uh, where you might be able to look at that. All those uh, plays are obviously available as well for licensing if you like them. <laughs> um, uh, Margot uh, also um, co-authored Still They Remember Me, a bilingual book of traditional Penobscot, you'll have to tell, tell me if I said that wrong, stories with Carol Dana and Connor Quinn, which grew out of a theatrical production called Transformer Tales, Stories of the Dawnland. Please correct me if I'm wrong, Margot. I'm gonna pass it to you, let me know, <laughs> and I will, erase myself from this uh, video wall. Well, thank you, Deborah, before you get erased. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, I'll just say the last piece there, the um, play Transformer Tales was presented, um, it, it premiered at the Indian Island School, which is on the Penobscot Nation, and then went to the Penobscot Theater, which is the furthest north, um, professional equity house in this part of the country. And then uh, we went down to um, Mount Desert Island because the occasion of the play was the 100th anniversary of Acadia National Park. So that's enough about me. Now I want to introduce the rest of the panelists here who are um, all well connected to William Yellow Robe's life and works and um, each one of them will have wonderful stories to tell. So I'm going to start with Diane Freyer, who is a nationally recognized screenwriter, director, producer, and leader in contemporary Native American arts, who makes feature films about the struggle of Native Americans to identify with traditional values within the context of modern society. Um, and as a side note, William Yellowrobe played a small role in her newest film, uh, The Heart Stays. She's an enrolled citizen of the Osage Nation with documented Cherokee her heritage. She's one of um, the artists who formed the New York movement in contemporary native arts. And Diane is the founder and director of Amarinda, American Indian Artists, Inc. And it's the only multi-arts organization of its kind for Native American artists. Vicki Ramirez, who is Tuscarora, is a playwright, director, theater maker, and educator based in New York City. She's a founding member of Chukalukoli Native Theater Ensemble and a resident playwright at New Dramatists. Her plays include The Ally, Uchewake, Apple, Smoke, Ashes, Pure Native, Standoff at Highway Number 37, Snooky is a terrorist, and Glenburn 12 WP. Bob Jaffe, he's an actor director based now in New York City, 
who has worked with William S. Yellowrobe Jr. on many productions and readings of his works. Um, at the Public Theater, uh, Ensemble Studio Theater, Queens Theater, Ars Nova, Berkshire Theater Festival, The Cell, Here, Fringe New York City, Trinity Rep, Providence Black Rep, Perishable Theater, and others. Um, he's also worked in film and TV on uh, FBI, The Tonight Show, and he can tell you more about the viral video with Brad Pitt and Jimmy Fallon, Law and Order, SVU, and many films. He's a member of Ensemble Studio Theater. And Madeline Sayet from Mohegan is a theater maker whose work is shaped by the idea of story medicine, the belief that every story we put into the world has the power to do real world harm or healing. And uh, her work as a stage director of new plays, um, classics and opera has led to her being named a Forbes 30 under 30 in Hollywood and entertainment. She's been a TED fellow and MIT Media Lab Directors Fellow and an NCA IED Native American 40 under 40, um, <clears throat> as well as a recipient of the White House Champion of Change Award from President Obama, a National Directors Fellowship and a National Arts Strategies Creative Community Fellowship. Um, right now, she's assistant professor in the English department at Arizona State and executive director of the Yale Indigenous Performing Arts Program. And she's getting ready for her solo performance piece, Where We Belong, to open soon at the Public Theater in New York. So um, I have a... a little bit of a structure here for us. And I'd like us all to take a turn first and go around talking about how we first met William Yellow Robe. Um, what were we doing? What did that result in? And, and what were our impressions that um, immediately happened? And maybe each one of us has something that uh, the others might not know about him. So, um, can we, can we go in the order that I introduced you? That would be Diane first. Thank you, Margo. Um, I would just like to say first off that it, uh, it's a pleasure to be in the presence of so many people on this panel that I know and, and am so comfortable with. And um, I'm grateful for the opportunity. I, I thank Deborah for reaching out to me. And, and uh, it's an honor always to, um, to reflect on Bill Yellowrobe um, having passed been a part of my life. Um, I, I first met Bill in the um, uh, 1980s, early 80s. And he was, I believe, and Bob may know about this. He might, this might be in some place where it connects up to Bob a little bit was he, uh, where Kurt Dempster was the then artistic director of the um, ensemble, EST, Ensemble Studio Theater in New York. And I believe, which Bob, which, uh, uh, Bill was a member of, and I think he was involved in a workshop up there. Um, we really were artists of a certain generation. And so, and both of us had come from community. And so, um, with our, growing up with our folks. And so we really just immediately found common ground. And for a long time, uh, it seemed like I knew Bill forever. <laughs> I just, because it was, I felt, we, I just enjoyed our friendship so much and I respected him and, and, and his vision. Um, one thing I would say that affected me was from the very beginning was his vision um, that for, for Native theater, for all of us, all the myriad of Native voices um, to be able to be to be heard. It wasn't just about him and his career. It was, again, um, grounded in, in a real strong sense of community and that this, uh, for Native people that we, um, the, the emphasis is on the extended family. And you really felt, you really felt that emphasis with him. I did from the very beginning. That's great. What a great start. All right. Can we go to Vicki? 
What about your first meetings and impressions with um, Bill? Thank you so much again. I also want to um, express my gratitude and honor for being asked to speak about Bill, who was this giant in our community, a great leader, and again, wonderful people to be on this panel with. Good to see you all. Um, I first met Bill, well, first I was working, still pretending to act. So I was working with Chukalakola and Bill got us a, um, a connected with Kurt Dempster who put up in the spirit there for the weekend. And then later I met Bill as an actor because he was directing, uh, mentoring one of his, his mentees in the city. And I was t wholly intimidated, very impressed by this sort of force of nature, you know, because when he walked in a room, every head turned. Um, but he called me out on something that I'll never forget. Like he was directing me and I brought in a pair of earrings that were massive that my mother had, had made for me by a cousin. And I never wore them publicly. I never wore them out because, you know, I where I grew up, we, I grew up in the town just bordering my mom's res. And, you know, you were made fun of if you were overtly Native. You were, sh you know, you were shamed out and everything um, for being too Native. And in our, this was way in the early 90s, like around 1990, I'm going to say three or four. Um, and... Um, I had brought them as props for the show we were doing and I had made fun of them. And he just, he stopped me right there. He's like, don't do that. Don't do that. He's like, somebody made that for you with love. And he's like, why are you so ashamed? Why are you so embarrassed? And it just sort of pulled me up in my tracks and I realized, oh, there's that self-loathing stuff. There's that generational trauma stuff that, you know, we thought we were cool because we mocked people at that time who, what we thought we called cosplayed for the white people, you know? But at that time, I'm like, no, he's like, be proud. Somebody made that for you with love. And he just smacked some reality into me. And I'm like, wow, okay, <laughs> this is somebody to listen to. You know, this is a great, brilliant voice. Um, so that was my first meeting with Bill. Thank you. That's great. Bob. Uh, hi, it's, it's, as you both said, it's an honor to be here um, and an honor to be uh, honoring Bill and talking about Bill and his work. Um, I did not meet Bill at Ensemble Studio Theater. I got involved in the Ensemble Studio Theater much later than Bill did. Um, and but I met Bill when he was a playwright in residence at Trinity Repertory Company in Providence, Rhode Island, and I was living at the time in Providence. And a friend of ours, um, mutual friend of ours, came to me, a woman that I had directed in a play, and said, I need you to meet this man. I think you'll get along well with him. And I think you should look at his work. So she arranged an introduction with Bill, and Bill and I met. Um, he, he, even though Bill was playwright in residence at Trinity, he was known for sitting in the coffee shop on the street, kind of adjacent to Trinity, and just having conversations with people. So we met there, and we must have talked for at least an hour, if not more. And um, it was the beginning of a long-term friendship of maybe 20 years. Um, I then... Um, the thing that impressed me the most, because I had seen a reading of one of Bill's plays and um, the play was transformative as, um, and as I got involved with his work, I, I was continually transformed by, by his writing. Um, but the cast was, um, some, of the, some of the cast was outstanding and some of the cast was unpolished. And I spoke to Bill about that because I thought um, he might be looking at better actors for his work, to represent his work. And that was the first lesson I learned, which has lived with me until now. Bill impressed upon me that his work 
was more about building a community than it was about having a slick production. And so as we worked together, there was always a combination of people that, um, and I directed two of his plays and I acted in one directed by Maddie Syed and produced by Amarinda. Um, but um, there was always a confluence of people that made up a whole rather than individual talents that would bring the work to life. So through the, through the building of a community and the building of a whole, we managed to um, see the work come alive. And the, the community that he built are people that for, for the most part, I still stay in touch with, all of whom were touched by Bill, all of whose lives were changed by their association with Bill. And um, his legacy, um, long after he's gone, will continue to affect us for the rest of our lives. So that, that was um, around 2002, I met him and uh, directed one of his plays two years later, another one in 2013, sorry about the phone, and then Powell Highway, um, which Maddie directed later. Thanks, Bob. Maddie, why don't you tell your story next and then I'll, I'll wrap up this part. And... Sure. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, uh, first of all, thank you so much, as everyone said, uh, for inviting me to be here and need to share some of my experience of uh, my friendship with Bill and also of his work. Um, it's a good group of people to be able to be in conversation with tonight. Um, uh, so my my first the, I first met Bill actually what what happened basically was um, my final year of undergrad at NYU there was a Native American theater course being taught uh, and it was the first time that uh, you know I got to find out that we had Native theater uh, which was uh, never never occurred to me prior to that I knew we had our traditional storytelling and I had been you know taught about Western theater but I, I didn't know we had Native theater um, and. Uh, and when, when I took that course, it was revolutionary for me because suddenly, you know, our cultures were centered in one of the main playwrights featured in that course, of course, was, was uh, Bill. And um, the following summer, right after I, um, I graduated, uh, my sister forwarded me this call. And at that point, I wasn't sure I wanted to keep doing theater. I wasn't sure what I was going to do. My sister forwarded me this call for actors for, to come up to be in a reading of Bill's play, uh, Woodbones, up in Maine. And... Uh, I thought, oh my God, he's famous. I read his play in class, you know? And um, so so I submitted. And when I got up there, I was the only one, <laughs> I was the only one uh, who had come up to do it. But um, but I immediately met Bill and he was this person who right, I thought was supposed to be famous and uh, was like the most humble individual in the world. And they were like, hey, can you give him, you know, uh, can you drive him around while, while you're in town because uh, he doesn't have a car. And, and it was like, to me at the time, I was like, what? get to drive the yellow room around you know um this is very exciting and and it was it was then that i started to be able to you know develop a friendship with him just just having conversations in the car honestly you know as a as like a, a 20 year old and um and there were a lot of really revolutionary things that happened for me during that time um uh you know he he was the one who really uh told me to trust my voice. He, he made me feel like I was, in that moment, he made me feel like I was a good actor when I felt like everyone in my training had said that everything was wrong with me. Um, he, uh, it, was, it was interesting. I always think about one of the first things he said to me when I met him was, I should have died last week. Um, and he told me this whole story about how he was supposed to have died the week before. And so I always, <laughs> I always thought about how I felt like my entire friendship with Bill was kind of like on borrowed time because, uh, yeah. He was supposed to have died apparently the week before uh, before I met him, and um, and you know he got me involved with native theater, and he basically told me um, that you know not to let anyone else ever tell you who you are, and to be able to really uh, to trust your work as a native artist. And working on his play up in Maine that first reading, it was really the first time I had worked on a play that actually resonated, that actually mattered, that I got to understand what native theater was. And the minute I started directing. He went and told people I was a director, even though he hadn't seen my work. And I was like, what is giving you this like absurd faith in me? And and he just he just was like that. You know, he just believed in people. Um, and uh, he was always like that. And like Bob said, you know, he was he was really concerned with like how we build community, not just uh, how things look superficially. 
And it was just such an important uh, lesson and mentor to have uh, to carry with me, you know, always in my work, whenever I'm working, thinking about what are we actually doing this for? You know, it's it's really about like, what is its long term effect? How is it building this group of people together? How is it carrying us um, into a space uh, that helps us, you know, be a community and, and hear these stories fully and learn these things about ourselves? Um, as a community and and never just like oh it's a play and it's superficial and all of that and and i remember the very last thing i worked on him with um up in maine was was a solo show about his own life and i just remember mm. thinking what a life you know how much he'd been through um and and that he was still um teaching and learning up until the very end was just um so so you know incredible that i feel like there was never a moment i was in his company where he wasn't making a joke about something or really learning something himself he, he always uh even on that like that reading he always he always was you know still uh surprising himself as much as he was surprising me and still processing things that he'd been through thanks maddie yeah i i am very honored to be with this group of people i'm i'm the odd person out not a theater professional, um, but I've been a person who loved theater forever. And one of the things that happened was as, as an English professor who teaches Native American literature, I was looking for a way to make my, you know, my, my community theater life, my uh, outside of, of the job life and my research begin to resonate together more. And uh, so I, um, I'd heard of Bill Yellowrobe. I'd heard in the nineties of him and couldn't figure out how to find his plays at that point. Um, none of them had been published and, uh, I'm up in Maine and, uh, all, I don't know how I found the advertisement for a reading of, um, grandchildren of the Buffalo Soldiers at Trinity Rep when he was their artist in residence. And um, it, it was uh, in the early winter of 2003 and they were doing a staged reading. And so I had begun um, at that point teaching a course. It was the first time I'd ever taught a whole course of drama of plays by native playwrights. And I tried to get all of my students. I only got one of my students to come down, but um, went to the show and was so amazed by the strength of the play and the depth of uh, emotion. And, you know, he was apparently unafraid to look right in the face of all these things uh, about race within family and within communities. And I, uh, you know, listened to the talk back and after the show went up to say hello and, and just to tell him how uh, much I appreciated it. And um, I said, I wish people here in Maine could see this play that there are things that people in native communities in Maine would really, you know, want to hear. And um he said, well, this play is going on the road, but not for a couple of years, but I'll come visit in Maine. And so that uh, began really a, a 20 year relationship for us. So I, I brought him to Maine within a couple of months and uh, um, he, we did some quick and dirty readings of his scripts right there on campus, you know, got space, got people. Um, there was an interested group of um, native Wapanaki people and other native people here on campus who um, had begun studying, uh, you know, native drama and, and they were really interested in participating. And so he didn't care. He was like, let's cast you know, everybody, anybody who's, who wants to participate. And it was, as, as people have been saying, um, it was about building from the ground up and Within a year, I managed to um, get him on campus for most of a semester as a Libra professor, um, which is a, a visiting professorship we have in Maine. And um, 
he directed a full production of Better Than Indians. And that was, you know, all kinds of firsts for the University of Maine. The first time uh, a play by a Native playwright had had a full production. And most of the cast members were Native people, um, many from Maine, others from, you know, nearby campus. And um, it was just, uh, out, and out of that, um, again, some lifelong relationships um, of those people with Bill. And um, one of them actually ended up in the Perishable Theater production that Bob directed of uh, Better Indians. And, and so that was, you know, the beginning. And he, he, he lived in Rhode Island for a while and then out to South Dakota and then back to Connecticut and then up to Maine for a while. He and Jeannie uh, got married um, shortly after I met them and then uh, out to Montana and then back to Maine. So over the, the span of those 20 years, there was a lot of travel and a lot of um, going places to visit Bill and having Bill come spend, you know, um, semesters or, or at least extended stays uh, at University of Maine. So I mentioned better than Indians, but um, I think maybe it would be wonderful for people to hear about the plays that you all are familiar with and, and maybe have worked on with Bill. Maddie mentioned Woodbones. Um, who, wants to, who wants to jump in on that? Well, since I directed the original productions, professional productions of both Ben and Indians and Woodbones. <laughs> I'll start. Um, yeah, we did uh, Ben and Indians at Perishable Theater. It was 2004. Uh, Nick Bear from Maine came down uh, to play a role. And Nick was, you know, I think he was 17 or 18 at the time, untrained. But, you know, again, it was you know, Bill's choice to have him there. And there was a reason to have him there because he brought um, his experience to the play. And um, yeah, it's, I bet an Indians is a, it was fantastic. It was, um, it's a series of vignettes. Um, I, I asked Bill, the, the series of vignettes strung together by a character named Adam Redman. And I was having problems casting Adam Redman and decided that the best person I could have to play that role would be Bill. <laughs> and it was, he was amazing. <laughs> and he was respectful. The, the thing that interested me too, as the playwright, he was respectful of the fact that I needed time with him there and I needed time without him there. So as the playwright, you know, he was there because when I direct, particularly when I directed Bill's work, but when I direct anyone's work, um, I primarily work on new plays. Um, I always feel it's, I always feel like the playwright is an important voice in the room because we're there to realize the playwright's intent. We're not there to stroke my vision of the play. We're there to bring the playwright's play to life. And, um, so it was important to have Bill there, particularly for me, because I did not understand all the cultural references that he had within the play. So it was critical that he was there as a as a resource for me. But he also knew at a certain time he said, I'm I'm not, you know, you work on the other scenes. I'm not coming to rehearsal for a while. You need time on your own. And he left me. Um, with that. And the same thing happened with Woodbones, which I directed in New York in 2013. Um, and uh, he was less available at the time, and I actually wanted him there more, but I couldn't, so we had a lot of phone conversations. But um, yeah, he he really understood when it was important to be present and when it was important to allow others to do their work. And I really appreciated that about him. Um, you know, we in in the interim between the uh, Ben and Indians and Woodbones, we did a number of readings. We did a reading of uh, Grandchildren of the Buffalo Soldiers at at um, at 
Foxwoods Casino. Um, there, there was an attempt there to try try to set up a, a tribal theater program, and um, Bill and I were trying to convince them to um, set up a training program first, and then build a company from that. And that didn't ultimately materialize, but we did a wonderful reading of the play there uh, for two days, and it was really well received. But um, the the thing that struck me about Bill's work is that he had an amazing capacity to take very culturally specific work and write in such a way that I could sit in an audience and absorb the themes of the play in my soul and not just be an observer and not just be a participant, but be actively engaged in what was happening on stage. And I think that's why um, and for the time that we did work together, we worked well together because we had lots of conversations about that. We had lots of, um, of you know, I felt honored that he trusted me to um, do, do the work on his plays. And, and um, you know, and there came a time when, um, after Maddie came into his life, when when it was important for Maddie to take over that mantle of of representing his work, and I was thrilled to be part of her world when she directed Powell Highways. But I'll let her talk about that. <laughs> anyway, that's my perspective. Thanks, Bob. I guess I'll <clears throat> I guess I'll talk now. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about some of his different work. And I was thinking about some of his later works um, that I feel like don't get as much maybe attention because they're not in the bigger anthologies that end up getting published. Um, I feel like one of my, the one, one of the ones that strikes me most is I think Frog's Dance um, because it was written so much from the perspective of him after he had lost his leg and, um, and what that, that sort of meant for him. Um, but also, you know, there's there's a character in it that's much younger and that that he's, you know, when we worked on the scenes from that, he was he was in it again. And I think that's why I'm thinking about it. Um, yeah, it's funny, Bob, when you said that about, about uh, you know, me working with him after, because I was just making me think about how, again, with that belief thing, it was like, it was so I did I did the original reading this this really early reading and I played of Woodbones I played this one character and then I did this other reading of Woodbones and he gave me then like a bigger part and then after that he's like now you are director I feel like I just keep getting promoted and I don't know why <laughs> um, uh, uh, but I guess hey you know what that's that's good uh, good that he good that he trusted me um, but. Uh, but yeah, I mean, so so his adaptation of Powell Highway was really exciting to work with him on um, because, you know, uh, I feel like Bill didn't do a lot of adaptation necessarily. Um, sometimes I feel like in in native theater, because we're often dealing with ancestors and things like that, there is a form of adaptation that shows up even when it's not adaptation. But um, uh, just in imagining what these people might have been saying to each other in different circumstances. But uh but yeah, Powell High was interesting because it it's it's an adaptation of a novel, but it is still very much a Billy Eller play um, in the humor, in in the tension, in the way things move, um, and and he he really does he he brings that that sense of humor into all of his plays, and I think I think especially when they're at their most gritty, um, and I think that that's part of what makes his play so powerful is that no matter what. He isn't afraid of going into the dark places, but he also brings so much humor and light to them at the same time. And there's there's a section, you know, um, in the play, in which, um, well, not to give it away, spoilers, but um, the, the the characters don't all survive. And but in the play, um, you know, it's really used through this metaphor of launching into space. Um, and and there was this long period where he he was like, you know, I was like. Because uh, the kid wanted to know the kid. There's a little kid in it. He said, "Well, like, are we dead?" You know, and I, was, <laughs> I said, "Let me, uh, let me ask Bill." And he, he basically said, "You know, like, well, what's really the difference? Like, is there a big difference between if they're going into the stars or if they're passed over?" And you know, and I thought that's actually a really good point. Um, uh, but you know, the kid was like, "Yeah, we're dead." Um, but um, but uh, but uh, but it was that that thinking about you know, it's never it's never quite so straightforward. It's never it's never linear. It's always it always has that that duality 
of of you know existing between worlds just like his plays do and i really think one of the things that keeps keeps impressing me keeps amazing me the more that i think back on his work is he really is one of the first playwrights to really bridge uh native native stories and western theater as a form um and he really he does it so well and and when you were with him in the room he was one of those playwrights who's always like rewriting 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 so fast and so constantly and one of the first playwrights that i i as a young person was able to you know experience working with in that way and um he wrote a lot of different short plays too towards the end of his career there's so i mean there's so many plays it's like um, and some of them, you know, I don't even think are fully documented, which is the, is the sad thing uh, that are probably piecemeal in, in all of our collective inboxes somewhere. Um, uh, but but I also think about like, you know, there was a short play that I was working on with him uh, at the very end um, in which uh, he um, he was in the hospital and he didn't want to tell me he was in the hospital. And so he kept disappearing in the middle of the in the middle of the calls, but he was there in the hospital still trying to do rewrites um, on this play the entire time without without wanting to acknowledge, you know, that anything was anything was wrong. And it was it was still uh, incredibly funny. And he was was still doing rewrites somehow. And um, I just I just always think about that. But yeah, so in addition to the spectrum of the full the full length plays that, that we have of Bill's work, there's also a ton of really humorous short plays. Um, there's also solo work that he's written, you know, reflective monologues and things like that. There really is a wide spectrum um, of different things for different kinds of characters. Um, and some beautiful poetry. Beautiful poetry. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, what you're saying makes me think of Falling Distance, which is, you know, the, the play where some characters have passed over and some have not, but the audience can see everybody and they can see each other, some of them. Yeah. I'm gonna pass on to uh, Diane or Vicky, who wants to go next? Go ahead, I, Diane. Um, Amarinda produced Pow Wow Highway, and we produced a lot of, quite a bit of Bill's work, which I is definitely an honor and very important to me uh, that, we, that we were able to do that. It was a great blessing for all of us. Um, for me, the, the thing that was important about Bill's work was that he, in the case of Pow Wow Highway, he, that, well, the book, The Pow Wow Highway, had really captured a moment in time um, of Native people in the 1970s. And I felt that in some way, when he wrote the stage version of, of the story, that it, once again, we were capturing a moment in time of, of Native people emerging once again, many, many years on. Um, and, and that was something that was always there in his, for me, in the work that, the, the plays that I liked that he wrote that resonated for me personally was always this, he would capture a moment in time. He, he would reflect on some, something that maybe it was always there, but, but nobody had seen it before or thought about it. Um, and it, a lot of people writing in Native theater, there's a lot of people, folks uh, writing about identity politics, but Bill was interested in, he wasn't so, mu so much interested in the things that have been done to us as colonized people, as uh, um, subjugated people, uh, but what we do to ourselves. Well, that was most important to him because that's where the transformation is. That, that's where the hope of the future is. If we can summon the courage to, um, to take a look at those things because we can change those things. And so I think that's, that's if, if, you wanna, if, if you wanna see the hope for Native people that he held, then, then you, would, you would find that in the work of you know this like i said this idea the things that we do to ourselves which keep us from from being able to recover or recover more at any given time um and as i said that 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 uh, it, it, to be able to have a sense of a moment in time for us as native people um and and to be able to just sit down and write a story that that captures that that essence at that particular time. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's that's really 
um, you know, it is one of the ways that that his work became, you know, completely present and also in some ways really timeless. Mm -hmm. Mickey. Um, so I never worked directly co-writing or anything like that with Bill, but um, first of all, I'm going to name my favorite. Uh, well, I have many favorites, but I still love Sneaky so much. I still love Sneaky because Sneaky is exactly what Maddie was talking about, that sort of that something really poignant and emotional, something that it, it could become in other hands, this sort of really huge, painful event, but still it was very, very much an indigenous voice. You know, we're used to trauma, we're used to pain. So the, the humor in that just rippling through it. And I'm like, that felt like I was sitting amongst my uncles almost. <laughs> It was just that sort of ability to capture that intimacy, that that indigenous intimacy. And he wasn't afraid of writing us in that way. You know, he wasn't afraid of showing like Diane mentioned, showing our spots so we could look at it and he, find ways to heal with it. But he he you know, if there was a, a character who had flaws, he wrote them. He wasn't afraid. He didn't shy away from that. And over the years, like I would go see readings and he kept telling me, Vicky, tell me when you're up in the city and I'm coming up for a reading. And it's like, usually I was up in the West Coast. <laughs> you know, so it's like, but we would, I would sit and talk with him about writing every time at these readings or performances, uh, saw Wood Bones, saw Thieves, saw, you know, it, it's just, um, he would sit and talk and we'd talk about these things about, you know, community and how we create an indigenous community and stop getting, you know, stop looking at each other as taking from each other, but trying to find ways to, to create this sort of like as a wave, you know, and we would talk about things like, like I would tell him, you know, there's this director who doesn't, cause I like to have a lot of, you know, breaking the fourth wall with one character or two or, and, and, I would tell him, you know, this director's telling me I can't mo have my person just turn and talk to the audience like a, like an ancestor, like a spirit. And he's he's like, he was the one who told me, he's like, it doesn't matter what their rules are. They're, they're telling stories for their people. You're telling stories for your people and your people do this. So <laughs> he's like, if you're writing it, your people do this. So just, he's like, trust, just say, look, I'm sorry. That's how we do it. <laughs> so he allowed me to, he really encouraged me to trust my instincts when it comes to writing and, and follow, follow my, follow my gut. It's, you know, he's like, people are giving you those stories that way for a reason, you know? So that's, that's my choice. Yeah. Well, you know, I, as people are talking, I'm thinking about um, early on, some of the plays that Bill offered uh, us to work with at Maine, I mean, he he brought the production of Veteran Indians, which has in it a lot of satire and a lot of parody, a lot of laughter and some, you know, really sad moments. But um, the other play that he had us work seriously on, and we took it uh, on a bit of a travel in the state of Maine to um, uh, the campus in uh, Machias, which is another one of the University of Maine system campuses. And we, we did this um, stage reading of a stray dog. And a stray dog is, you know, there's, it, it, it's inside a family like grandchildren of the buffer so, buffalo soldiers, but it's, you know, there's practically a, you know, a crucifixion or, you know, a, 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 a Sundance. It, it's, Oedipal it's, struggle. Yeah, yeah. I, did, I did a reading of that play as well, and I was I really felt it should be produced, and everybody was scared of it. It's ah. it's so emotional. It's so but it's so powerful. It's yes, beautifully written. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think you know, um, you know, there's a future in which uh, you know a, a theater company is not going to be afraid and is going to want it, and and you know know that, and and in his way to know that it is what a community needs, right? Or it's, it's what, uh, you know, will give something to the audience. 
that that will heal hurt and heal you know what i mean i think one of the things that i think is just so incredible about bill is also just how prolific he is like compared to anyone else i've ever met the number of plays he wrote is truly mind-boggling he was mm-hmm. constantly 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 writing um and so it is kind of amazing that there are a lot of these plays that actually haven't been produced because of the fact that like native theater wasn't being produced in that way um at that time and so there's lots of opportunities for theaters to do a first real production of a lot of these works yeah yeah and you're right about all the many many scripts that probably are you know are out there floating and um after Chase Weaver did um, Restless Spirits, um, then, then when Bill passed, uh, pretty soon he was back talking about, well, should we you know, do another? I, and uh, you know, obviously, yeah, there are lots of plays of his that are um, unpublished and really, really worth reading. So do we want to um, turn, we can bring, bring the talking about the plays into, uh, thinking about his legacy. Um, And it might be that we wanna talk about his influence on your own personal life and career. Um, Something that you learned that has really been formative um, or something that you think might've been his biggest accomplishment or one of his his biggest and most influential um, activities. So, um, you know, consider, consider that in, and whether he spoke about um, a consciousness of his own legacy or of the future. Go ahead, Vicki. I mean, for me, I think the biggest thing for, that I carry from having known Mr. Yellow Robe and, and been around while well, he's worked in the city a lot, um, is that idea of raising up together, you know, raising us all up together. And I've been slowly but surely trying to figure out a way to call us together and share resources because our communities are so small, especially over, you know, And um, I think it definitely came out of some conversations we had about, wouldn't it be great if we knew that over here, this person was there and maybe the resources could be pulled together to bring that beater in to create, you know? And um, so that idea of almost like in my dreams, in my daydreams, like this native Lort theater, string string of native theaters across the country where we could have a show, put it up and not have to modify it. That's like, kind of my my daydream and uh, you know I joked about it with Mr. Yellow Robe a couple times before (laughs) but uh, and uh, for me I I think it definitely came out of the conversations and also leadership one thing I have to say more than anything else more than anybody else he always showed up he always showed up for everybody even if he disagreed with the situation disagreed with the creator, disagreed with the circumstances, he showed up and he would speak about it. He would. He was never afraid to be present and to hold space and to speak to, you know, be, be represented and make sure the voice was heard, you know? And I, I respect the daylights out of that because not a lot of people do, you know? Thank you. Um, Diane, go ahead. Yeah. I think that a couple of things. I think that when we did Bill's memorial, it, it just, I just felt that it was so important to say that it was up to us now that he had given us all of us, what we needed, he'd given us a body of work. He'd helped us to to build character and strength of character and to believe in ourselves as native people. Um, And that that was gonna be with us and that not to, um, not to to squander it and not to take it for granted. And um, that native 
it, it's up to us now, the survival of Native theater. Um, but he's given us what we need to do that. And for me, the other thing is that, and this has been uh, alluded to in the conversation by all of us, um, is um, the love that he felt for other people in community, um, that that's part of building Native theater is how we care about one another and show that to one another and, and how, um, because that's how we care, carry on his essence with us. And this idea like they talked to you in the, at home, like in the medicine lodge, this idea of um, everything, you, you can lose everything, everything can change. Um, but the love that you feel for someone and the love that you show for someone else stays with you. That can't be taken from you. And when someone goes home to the creator, well, you still, that love, the love you felt for them will always be there with you and you can call upon it. So I think that he gave, he helped us, he gave that gift to us as well. And so I think I'd like to, I'd, I'd like to, to, to carry on in that way and know that he, his, the, the love he gave us is there with us and we, we, will, we will have it to go forward with, that we're not, we're not alone, is that that spirit's always there. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks Diane. Go ahead, Bob. Um, I, I'm not a Native person. Um, I grew up in a traditional setting and got a traditional education. And Bill, my meeting Bill and my working with Bill opened a uh, history to me that I was not aware of, um, that I became, that became, um, central to my view of the world and my view of this country. Um, you know, it's interesting, Diane, I want to credit you. Um, you don't know this, so, but um, uh -oh. theater companies, I, I, for 10 years, I was chair of the board of Ensemble Studio Theater. I recently stepped down as chair. And theater companies over the past couple of years have been doing land acknowledgments. And I started a different tradition because I ran across this through another group that I work with, that I'm working with right now, as a matter of fact. Um, Diane um, crafted not a land acknowledgement, but a people acknowledgement. And I, if, if, if I have your permission, Diane, I'd like to read it. Um, Native people are not figures of the past. We have a living culture. People's acknowledgements give voice to the Native people and brings them into the present. Land acknowledgements can lead to an erasure of the communities that are still here working to empower Native Americans and foster an intercultural understanding and appreciation of the thriving Native cultures that exist today. And I, I thought that that was um, such an important take as, as people are acknowledging the past, we also need to acknowledge the present. And I think by by making Bill's work a part of our lives and a part of the canon of plays that are being done, we keep that in front of us and we keep that acknowledgement of the present and of the humanity that he represents through his work um, in our lives. So that's what I feel his legacy is. Um, I'll speak uh, quickly, although I, I'm not sure if someone else is trying to get on now. Um, but uh, I, um, I always think about, I think, the ways in which he was uncompromising in terms of the focus of his work. I think that as a mentor, um, when I think about someone who really had a, a fierce sense of self um, and of an understanding on what he was willing to compromise on and what he wasn't willing to compromise on, um, I think of Bill and I think of the fact that, you know, yeah, the play could be done for community, but it wasn't suddenly going to be done in a way that didn't make any sense for Native people, right? Like there were certain values that were instilled in his work um, that he he carried with such a, a sort of sense of intense ferocity and, and joy that I feel like 
um, is, is what I hope that I carry when dealing with my work is, is this sense of like the story is supposed to be told for certain reasons and you can't, you can't change those reasons. You can't just take it and throw it away in a different direction and, and hope for the best, but that actually like the values of the piece uh, should be very clear in the piece. And I think that, that his plays are like that. When you read the plays, you understand um, the values that he carried with him in his work. And, um, and I hope that he continues to be, to be taught as well as performed to be prolific. I mean, I, I joke that, you know, the, um, the, the, the I, I read his play before I met him and he was famous to me, but then the fall after that, I took a, a literature course, a native literature course at Columbia and his play was taught, a different one of his plays was taught again, you know? And that was within like a very short period of time. I, and I had met him at that point. So then I was cool, you know, but, um, <laughs> but uh, I, it was, it was, you know, it was, it was within that span, I went from not knowing about native theater to being taught, taught Nate Bill's plays twice, you know, and, and, and how significant that is. Um, and then that second time I, I was being taught it, but I kind of understood how they worked. And it was, it was very exciting to then be able to carry that analysis with me. And I think, I think whenever I think about what do I want to pass down that I learned from Bill, I think it has to do with the ways in which as native people, we stand up for ourselves, um, in the rehearsal room in which we give voice to certain things. Um, and, and I just, I think about how tenacious he was and for how long and i just i hope i hope i can carry like a small bit of that amount of spirit that he had to keep pushing until the very end because he never stopped not only pushing uh for other native artists but also pushing himself you know that the, i remember working with him this very last solo show he was writing about his own life watching him do rewrites but also watching him choose to tackle issues in his own life that he was scared to up until that moment um and how profound that was to be watching someone at that point in their career still acknowledging and realizing that there were things inside themselves that they were ready to tackle until that moment yeah so um, I'm trying to think about the things that I want to carry on. And, you know, one of them is as a teacher, I continue to, um, you know, have my students read his plays and, uh, you know, buy the book, that kind of thing. Um, but one thing that sticks with me is how he was always looking for the next opportunity. And it wasn't about, you know, where do I get paid? It was when can we do a reading? When can we, you know, show somebody this play? How can we, you know, um, get something out there? And in Maine, it, he he began teaching um, Wabanaki people, people of Native people of Maine, uh, how how to write their plays. And he was also really energetic, you know, in uh, creating opportunities for those plays to get out. And so. Um, I and mean, I think that's one thing I want to remember is it, it, it doesn't have to be a full production. It doesn't have to be s smooth. It it can be pretty quick and dirty. And that was, he was like that from, you know, the, when I first met him, you know, that that was always worth doing. And, and that was one of the ways you uh, keep yourself um, learning and, and begin to figure out what's, you know, what's the next thing that I want to write. Um, there's a I, I'm seeing questions coming from the audience and I want to share a question with people. I'll, I'll say a little bit about it, but maybe others of you have have some answer for this, too. But the question is, um, was Montana a necessary touchstone to his voice? And uh, also that questioner asks us to reflect on his sense of humor. And um, the, the questioner says that he was Bill's college housemate, Sean Walbeck. And um, I mean, some of the things that Bill told me about being in college in Montana, it was very formative. And it was also, uh, you know, the place where he realized, you know, he had to be among the people building Native theater. He had to build Indigenous theater because it, there, it wasn't there. It wasn't there. There were, you know, times when they said, well, you know, we can't cast you. We don't have a role for a big Indian guy. Um, but Bill was, you know, always rooted in his being a Cinnaboyne from Fort Peck, and he would 
uh, when he introduced himself, he would talk about his mother and his father and the names that they gave him and the names that they had. And um, absolutely, that was fundamental. Yeah, also very, very present in Better Nindens, a lot of references to Montana and to Fort Peck. Yes, um, right. And I think in some of the other earlier plays, yeah. So it was an important part of his identity. Mm -hmm. I think it, yeah, I think it shows up a lot, um, for sure. And in his yeah. sense, his sense of humor too, uh, that's the part of the question, uh, it shows up all sorts of ways. But yeah, Montana, I I think, in, in and then it circled back again in his later plays again too, where he was thinking about different stages of his life and things. And yeah, I, I think it's, it's always there in some way. I think that uh, also too, native people have a relationship to the land, mm -hmm. um, especially it's different than owning land or the buying property or investing in property or developing property. That, that that's over here, but native people have an a re, the, a relationship to the land in a specific place there, where their ancestral home is, and that's uh, that that's almost like he he couldn't have couldn't have not had it in a way. I, I have on my phone, I don't know if people can see this now. You can't see it. Not I have really. pictures from Better Nindens and it demonstrates his goofy sense of humor. I mean, I think as far as Montana goes, I think it's present in every play he wrote to me. Like you just, whether it's referred to directly or not, you feel the atmosphere of that place and you can almost feel like picture it in your mind it's he's very his writing is very evocative um and uh, uh yeah goofy sense of humor every say almost every say like honestly it, his humor is such a, a intrinsic part of his voice i think you know it's such a it's in every piece it's in every piece moments of wry humor and it's funny because I've had friends who are not native read his plays and they're like, I don't see what's funny. And I'm like, okay, all right, yeah, let's slow down. And then it's like, they, they see this beat right here? Yeah, I mean, that, that's in a morgue. That's in a morgue. Now think of that in a morgue. And it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know? And so his goofy sense of humor is all throughout his work. Yeah, we did a, uh, a memorial celebration at University of Maine about a year ago. And part of it was to read a few scenes from several plays and um, definitely made sure that that sense of humor was there, even in that memorial, you know. Um, we did a, um, a couple of scenes from Better Indians and um, one from Sneaky, of course, and then one from Falling Distance, which was, you know, e even in, in the poignancy, there, there are funny moments in Falling Distance. I also just wanted to say something I meant to touch on before in terms of something Marco had said about always being concerned just about when things were getting made instead of the money he was making. And I remember even at the towards towards the the end, right before he passed, he he always call me and he'd be like, I, I gotta talk about it. he would always be wanting to trigger trying to figure out, make sure he his plays would get produced after he passed away. Mm -hmm. He was very concerned about it. Um, and, uh, and so I think that actually like things like this are really, really great for that reason to really talk about how many different ways there are to do his work. Um, because I know that that was a big concern of his was that something would happen and then his works, you know, wouldn't continue to get produced because he cared so much about just them happening and community in any way, shape and form that they could. Yeah. And that's a lot of, after, after he passed, uh, Jeannie and I spent a lot of time trying to figure that out. And um, and also figure out a way for because Bill was so modest about asking for money for his work, mm -hmm. too modest in my opinion. Um, um, but to find a way that that his work could be supported, and we were fortunate enough to come upon the Dramatist Guild and form that relationship, and we're really thrilled. You know, I know that Je it was a big relief for Jeannie to Jeannie's Bill's wife, um, big relief for Jeannie to 
know that the work would be not only housed but proactively represented and that it would you know there would be efforts made to get it out in the world so I'm grateful to to Deborah for working with us and and making that happen. So. Yes, I I would second that. I I worried about that a lot, and you know it wasn't it wasn't appropriate to just put them in the library. Um, although his papers um, did go to um, now I'm going to forget the name of the library in Austin, Texas. Very they're, um, they're at the Ransom Center. Thank you. Yeah, the Harry Ransom Center. Um, which is an excellent place where many other uh, American playwrights works are um, housed. Um, we have an anonymous question, um, which uh, asks if we have the resources to produce one of Bill's plays, which one would you choose and why? Anybody want to pick a favorite, Bob? I, I think there's such a breadth of work. I it really depend. I mean, Better Indians is is funny. Woodbones is touching. You know, um, Powell Highway has both humor and really intense, you know, dramatic elements to it. Uh, those are the three I've been involved in. Stray Dog that we talked about. I, Stray Dog is the play that I would love to see produced because people were scared of producing it. Mm -hmm. um, so it really depends on what the potential audience might be and what it is that you want to explore. But there's such a range of work that that I think it, right. you, know, you could you could read the work, make a decision. <laughs> yes, right. I th and I think that the idea of what who is the audience, who do you want to reach, um, is really important. Yeah, because I don't think one play really encapsulates you know the the richness the 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 many aspects of Bill's voice you know he had so many takes on so many different things um so yeah I don't I mean I'm a big fan of sneaky a really big one but um, I I mean uh, uh, Woodbones I loved Woodbones too you know and yeah, Woodbones spans generations it's really interesting mm -hmm because of the structure of the play, it really, it, it spans generations of lives and lives that intersect through this house. You know? So it's it's an interesting play from that perspective. It also, I feel like, um, because it has like groups of people throughout time, it kind of feels like it encapsulates some of Bill's like genres that he moves through. And that also like, you know, it's like you get the humor, but then you get the, it kind of feels very complex in that way. I, for some reason, personally, when asked that question, I, I think I was I was drawn mentally to Frog's Dance. I think because mm -hmm. it makes me think of Bill. I think in that sort of later phase of his career, and so I think I'd be interested to explore it for that reason. But all those plays that are mentioned are so good. I would want to direct any of them. One that um, hasn't been fully produced is um, Native American Paranormal Society. I got to go out to Montana. There was a um, um, feeling its presence race in poetry conference and at University of Montana. And that was when Bill was in residence there um, probably about five years ago. And he wanted me to introduce the reading that was gonna be done by some of the students and faculty at the conference. And um, we, had, we had done it in Maine just as a reading and here they were you know, doing it in Montana. But that's, that's so wonderful because you know, he makes such a, uh, a kind of a send up of um, popular uh, interest in the paranormal. And it's sort of, it's almost like a sort of a um, it, allegory of people's bizarre conceptions about indigenous people as well. So uh, you're always feeling like, you know, uh, you know what should scare me more? <laughs> the paranormal part or the uh, looking at myself in the mirror part. Another question about the challenges of presenting. Oh, yes. And, uh, you know, I'll speak to that from my perspective. Um, you know, the challenge for me, the challenge would be for me today would be not having Bill <laughs> there, hmm. me, um, which would be an enormous challenge. Um, but I think, I think, you know, Bill is a resource 
for me was critical because the references in his plays were so specific um, that he brought um, he brought history, he brought knowledge, he brought um, uh, a perspective that I couldn't have um, adopted without him in the room. So I think I think the importance of having a resource available um, is really important. Um, somebody who can make sure that the the specific references come from specific places. You know, even when we were doing Woodbones, the the you know they were they were references to history and references to um, um, events that that only Bill understood where they came from because he wrote the work. But but there 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 um, so that to me would be a challenge today if I were if I were to um, try and present something. But um, but I think that. You know, there are people who can be helpful to make sure that these works are, are realized in, in, in the way they were intended. And I think the importance of, of getting them out in the world and keeping them there is worth the challenge of doing it. And the, whole, the whole question of like, what's the difficulty in, you know, um, working on them now, I think it's interesting, you know, Bob's Bob's uh, comment about not being able to have Bill in the room because it's that tricky thing of like you can't have actual Bill in the room working on the play now but the only way you can get Bill in the room at all is by working on the play mm -hmm. so um so <laughs> it's uh and maybe you'll get Bill in the room if you start working on the play you know <laughs> let's, I mean, let's be let's be realistic so um uh I I think it's it's a uh, it's a really, um, it's a really great opportunity for learning. Um, not not only you know in educational se settings, but also uh, there are so many things that we consider like tropes of native theater at this point that a lot of the t a lot of times sometimes they happen for the first time in one of Bill's plays, you know, mm -hmm. and then they just became normal to us later because we started doing them because they were, you know, they were working. But it, if unless you actually really like work on and look at these these sort of uh, seminal plays that existed uh, and developed over this this spectrum of time. I, I don't think you really ever get the full picture of of native theater, of America, of American theater, of of the breadth of what that is. Um, and there really is a lot I think that we can all uh, keep learning from these plays. And without Bill there, yeah, we have to do more work. We have to dig. We have to try and figure out what that weird reference he was making uh, was, or or sometimes just guess. And sometimes I guess wrong, and it's really like a dirty joke. And I was hoping it wasn't, you know. But uh, uh, but usually it is, you know. So so you know, there's. <laughs> Uh, there's there's a lot that can still be really fun to piece out, like with any play where you don't have the playwright in the room. Um, and I, I think that that's really part of the the journey and the exciting part of working on these plays. Should we go around one more time? Last last uh, thoughts for the evening. Um, uh, I would just like to say, if you're unfamiliar with Bill, or if you only know one play. Uh, please track down the DG's uh, um, connections and the references and start reading. It, it's going to open up. Like if you're interested in native theater, read Bill Yellowrobe. If you're interested in intimate, wonderful stories of interesting people that you don't know, read Bill Yellowrobe. If you want to see a quirky take on the world, read who's <laughs> just got that dark you know get humor again read bill yellow bill yellow robe he, he he if you want to understand indigenous issues also too read bill yellow robe like i i don't know where to stop with that because i could go on and on and on but that's i mean if i want to leave anybody with a takeaway that's i i would wholeheartedly agree vicky and you know, reading Bill Yellowrobe can also just be sitting in a circle, mm -hmm. just a group of people sitting in a, you know, I started by talking about his his sense of building community. And a lot of times we did readings, we just went to a room, sat in a circle and read his work and it comes to life. 
And it can be that simple. It doesn't have to be a full production. It can just be a simple reading. And it will open um, it will open him up to you in the way that he opened himself up to us. I, I can think of lots of instances in which, you know, like to what Bob was saying, like there, you know, we wouldn't be have a full cast for some reading he wanted to put on and then he'd literally go knocking on doors and, you know, get people to show up. Like that's how much he wanted to just to just have these plays read and to be able to talk about them. And I think that that's really important to remember. And I also in, in this conversation and actually thinking like, you know, I've, I've now hit this phase where I'm like, oh, my God, what am I going to do now that I can't call Bill and ask him for his advice on things? But actually, I can just read the plays. You know what I mean? I can I can. That's a whole he's created so much written work um, mm -hmm. that all of us can go through and learn from and experience and sometimes maybe not learn from depending on what it's about. But like, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to say all of his plays are like profound, right? That's not, that's not his style. <laughs> but uh, but uh, uh, yeah, there's just so much there that he's created that we're so lucky to have now. And we're so lucky that that Dramatist Guild is, is uh, going to maintain for us in this way. Yeah, yeah. I would say for me, I would just, you know, I'm so grateful that uh, Bill's work was published. We have these anthologies and just begin reading his work and go on an adventure and decide, you know, which, which play, well, I like this one better, or this one works for me or this, you know, what is he saying here? Just, just, it's all there. Like Maddie said, it's in his work. We have his plays. And they're accessible to us because the of the anthologies that's been that have been published, and now um, with the work that DG, but Deborah and them are doing there. So um, that that would be what what I would say if you didn't know him. And support Native theater, support Native because he lives in Native theater. I, I do want to thank everybody so much for your participation as as the person who had the honor of of reading his plays, not knowing anything about him at all, not knowing really about native theater and being given a, a, a lot of, uh, you know, paperwork and, and having the pleasure to read through and, and to get to hear frogs dance. Yes, I remember and sneaky and wood bones and all these beautiful, beautiful plays that are now sort of part of me as well. Um, it's just, an, it's, it's been a real honor to to hear everyone here tonight, and I and I know, I feel like I know Bill pretty well from just having read his plays and sort of been rolling in 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 the different articles and and poems and his spam rants, um, which you should check out too to hear his voice on our website. Um, you can hear some of them. Um, you know, you can really get a sense of him. But I I can see that he, like I said at the top of this, his. The relationships in the community he built is so apparent because anyone I call with a question, with a concern, with a, can you help me with this? The answer is always yes. And it's not because I'm lovely. It's, it's, it's because of Bill and, and what he, uh, what he's sort of built, what he has built um, for all of us and, and what he's left with everybody. So I, I really do appreciate all of your participation tonight and everyone that came to listen. And I and I hope this will be the first of many, many more conversations that we'll get to have on uh, Bill and his work. And and please, if you are interested in any title, even if I don't have it, just at, let's ask because we'll we'll find it. We want we want them all to stay um, in the canon. So um, please be in touch. Uh, thank you so much, Marco, for for leading us and Maddie and Vicky, Diane and Bob. And Jeannie, I know you're there. <laughs> so thank you for, for showing up. And uh, hopefully we'll, we will get to return together and uh, talk, talk much more on, on this great, incredible uh, playwright.